Okay, thank you a lot. Thank you to the organizers. And I will tell you and offer you uh, some recent results we have obtained on how norms change and how to change norms. So norms, we are all familiar with them. Conventions and norms, I will use the words as equivalent in this talk, are uh, money, language, politeness, standards of dress and decorum, notion of fairness, and so on and so forth are conventional. Money and language were noticed as conventional from the ancient Greeks. Think about the Thai. They are really widespread. They regulate our world. They are indeed one of the pillar of social order. They've been described as the foundation, grammar, cement of society, and they have peculiar pro properties. Like, for example, they determine our expectations on how others will act. So they allow us to coordinate smoothly. For example, I mean, if I meet someone new, I know I can shake my hand with the person. Uh, once established, they appear natural. So we tend to forget they were actually, they are conventional, they seem natural, and they are not always desirable or beneficial. Think about corruption, which is of course an undesirable norm. As a rule of thumb, to understand when something is a norm as a convention, think about uh, an unwritten custom shared through a community. So you have this notion of sharedness, you cannot create your own norm, of course. They are selected among two or more alternatives. So uh, uh, my pet example on this is having food is not conventional because we do need food, but having lunch at 12 noon or at 2 p.m. is actually conventional and depending on the culture where you are. There is a paradox about social uh, norm change is that social conventions are self-enforcing. So once you know there is a convention, Conforming is in your best interest when everyone is conforming to, for example, shaking it. However, we know, because we have historical data and we observe that they change and they can change. So how is this possible? This question is relevant also in light of the global challenges we are facing. And this 2016 paper in Science uh, defined social norms as possible solutions. And in the, we will return on, on this, but for now, the idea is that there are several global challenges face the so-called collective action problem, which are a problem in which the group would benefit from a certain action, but no individual has sufficient incentive to act alone. So the idea is, can we design or change social norms so that we collectively move to a different equilibrium that could be more beneficial to us? Before delving into this with more detail, I want to offer you uh, an overview on the mechanisms of norm change. This is a study we published, study we published uh, one year and a half ago, more or less, in uh, testing the hypothesis that there are three main drivers. The drivers are formal institutions, like for example, an authority that can impose and then sanction upon a norm, or, explicit, or, or someone that can fix explicit incentives for collective coordination. We have informal institutions like associations of citizens, leadership, charities, crime organization, which of course are not invested of the power of the official power of doing and imposing norms, but they influence norms a lot. And then we have a third case of spontaneous evolution and bottom-up processes. Among these, the idea of committed minorities is quite strong and is the idea of these uh, minorities, so group of citizens, or agents, users, who want to push a new norm and uh, to influence the majority. Our data come from the cultural evolution of language. We have 2,500 orthographic and lexical norm changes in two languages, English and Spanish, over two centuries. And we have situations like the one in this illustrative figure. For example, the change in panel A of the orthography of the word cuando in Spanish, meaning that means when. Or, panel C, the Americanization of spelling of, of certain words in US. And again, you, in this case, the word center. To be more precise on our data set, we have, for what, uh, for formal institutions, we have 23 orthographic shifts dictated by the Royal Academy of Spanish Language. So in Spanish, you have this Royal Academy who publishes the Dictionary of Spanish. It's a little bit different from English or Italian, where or many other languages where you have, let's say, a competition of dictionaries and you can check whatever you want. In Spanish, there is this dictionary, which is clearly hugely prominent over other dictionaries. 
Then for the case of informal institution, we have 900 orthographic changes suggested by US, US dictionaries in American English. And uh, you see, this is different because this is a suggestion. It's not prescriptive. So a publisher doesn't have obli an obligation, particularly in the past, to check the right spelling of words. And for the case of spontaneous evolution, we have two equivalent ways to produce Spanish subjunctive era esa. What is this? For 1500 verbs. So in Spanish, when you want to say something like if I were, you have two alternative ways to do it. You can say si yo fuera, si yo fuera. These are completely equivalent according to the academy I was mentioning before and to most, if not all, speaking, Spanish speaking people. Uh, so it's very interesting because you have a competition, however, between these two forms. Then you have the alternation of two written forms of the Spanish adverb solo, differing from an accent, and 46 cases of substitution of British forms, words, with American ones in the US. For example, garbage rubbish. This is a list we didn't compile, but linguists did. So what about our model? So we have our data come from Google Ngram, and it's year by year. So we have discrete time. And at every time, you have writers who want to insert a norm. And they choose between two competing alternatives, what we will call new and what we will call old. Why? Because in our dataset, we always have two competing norms, one of which take over, and this is the new one. They may do three things. They may follow an institution, that is, with a certain probability gamma, they open the dictionary, for example, and check for the recommended norm. Or they can sample the current language, that is, they don't open the dictionary, but they are, they are immersed in a linguistic environment, which in that precise moment has a certain share of people using one or the other alternative, and they will reflect these proportions in their choice. This is very similar to the neutral model for evolution, or they can be committed to a specific form. With a certain probability, see, they don't care about anything else that your, their own perf preference. This is something linguists uh, report on uh, in several instances, for example, in Spanish, those who use era only use era, while those who use ese predominantly also may switch. So you see there is a sort of intrinsic strength of era from the point of view of those who use era as their preferred form. Then, if the institution may, the, okay, so th there is just one parameter to check, that is the effort of the institution. That is, the institution uh, will either recommend one of the two alternatives, and in that case, this parameter is set to one, or it will be neutral and saying up to you. Like, if you open the Spanish dictionary, the two subjunctive forms are equivalent from their point of view. So these are the equations. They are very simple. And you see, you have the frequency of the new norm and the old norm, and there are three terms. In the first one, the writer is not committed, and it doesn't check the authority, and just samples the language. This is the neutral model for evolution. In the second term, however, the uh, writer may be uh, not committed, but yes, willing to check the dictionary. And then there is a third contribution from writers that are committed. Of course, you can write, these are equations for the case in which commitment supports the new convention. You see C is for the equation of N. And you can have the similar for writers that support the old convention. And this is an important case because you have, for example, re-editions of past books account uh, years later and they look like a committed agent, a committed writer who keeps writing as you would in the past. This is the solution. So I don't want to enter into the details of the solution. What's important is that time appears at the exponent and that this uh, equation reduces to a step function for immediate adoption in, if two circumstances are satisfied, which is the authority indicates one norm and everyone follows the authority. So as at least a qualitative nice feature. And these are the comparison with the data. So for the case of formal institution, we rescale time so that at zero is the moment in which the authority 
made their choice in promoting the new convention, you see in the span of 10 years, you have this sudden jump in adoption of the new norm. In the inset, you have the different frequencies in time, but we don't want to go there now. And, uh, and you see that the, you can use our solution as a fitting function that works pretty well. The case of informal institution is, is quite similar. In this case, time is rescaled so that at time t0, the two forms are 50-50 in popularity. In the inset, you have the time in which this uh, happens. And the authority, sorry, the time in which the authority, the, the dictionary actually starts to propose the American spelling. These are American book, English books, pub, English language books published in the US. And, and the histogram tells you what the dictionary would, when the dictionary would give the suggestion to change spelling. And you see, however, the time scale is much longer here. It's probably 60, 90 years before definitive adoption. But once again, the model works pretty well. And this is the case of spontaneous change where you see things are way less dramatic and span over two centuries almost. And this is on the left, you have era versus Cese, solo versus solo in the center and the American versus British forms on the right. The authority here is neutral. So even if the author wanted to, if the writer wanted to check the dictionary, the dictionary would say up to you, okay? but you have committed agents for the new convention. So far we have seen, looked at averages, but for the case of formal institution, which is panel A, and for the case of informal institution, which is panel B, you can go at a microscopic level. For A, we have only 23 forms. So this is uh, actually individual curves. And from the point of view of US, there were too many 900, so we put them in decades or in period of, with the same uh, abundance of changes. And you see that there you have a, a certain coherence. This indication is very interesting because then we can use our model in a different way. That is, we can approach the curves microscopically. Each curve here is the competition between two, the relative abundance of two precise norms, and we can plot all of them. At this point, we only plot, of course, those for which we have enough points to have a meaningful individual curve, but they are actually many. And then we use our uh, solution of the model as a fitting function to estimate the strength of the authority, that is to estimate parameter gamma. And what we observe is that the three curve, the three mechanisms generate clearly different distributions for the parameter gamma, which as expected, and this is panel B, is uh, much larger for case of formal regulation and much smaller for case of informal institution. So this gives us a tool to estimate from an empirical curve the strength of an authority in impacting the norm change. So, the take home of this first part is that the dynamics of norm change is dictated by the presence and strength of the authority. We have universal pattern in the data, that, it, that is these three different classes we have identified are actually distinct from the point of view of a parameter that we control. And we have a method to infer the driver of norm change from the data. So now with a single curve, one could use the solution to infer this. Of course, this is true for norm change in language, and would be very interesting to apply it also to other domain. However, so this is the, the, the three mechanisms. The second part of this talk focuses more on the case of bottom-up processes, and in particular on the theory of critical mass. So critical mass is uh, a popular, even pop, form to uh, describe a very precise prediction. The prediction is that when a committed minority reaches a critical group size, the system crosses a tipping point and a new norm is established. So the idea is that you have this committed minority pushing a new norm. This committed minority is irrelevant up to the point in which it's very relevant and actually uh, can influence the majority. The theory of critical mass has been used to uh, rationalize a posteriori 
all kind of normative change from women's rights to legalization of marijuana and, and etc. However, the uh, evidence for it is quite feeble or was quite feeble. There, are, there is a crucial study, very, very important, uh, in 1977 by Cantor, who noticed that the quality of women's working lives depended on their representation in large industrial corporations. In particular, if they were below 15%, women faced very tough conditions, but when they made about 35%, things would change for the better. This is seminal paper, of course, but the observation is necessarily a bit episodic. We have evidence from schools where uh, this paper uh, highlights that you can reduce conflict by uh, encouraging a small set of students to take public stance against typical forms of conflict at their school. Uh, however, of course, this is not controlled and you could have that some of the students and actually you want to seek that are sort of leaders in the school. So it's, it's a bit conflated between informal authority and, and bottom-up process. What's sure is that uh, Many people believe in critical mass theory, and this could be a problem. For example, there are accounts of a state-run army of people that go online and by exploiting, at least in theory, the idea of critical mass, steer the conversation online, and could also be a solution. This is the paper I showed you before, and now we can read a paragraph of it better. And, uh, tasks. There are three crucial questions. Is a tipping point likely to exist? Can policy create tipping points where none exist? Can policy push the system past the tipping point? And this is restated, restated in a more recent 2019 paper, more uh, focused on post-carbon transition. And I quote from the paper, if a latent majority supports ambitious climate action, and if the size of the committed minority is close to a critical threshold, then a small kick may have an outsized effect. So again, there is this idea of critical threshold. To address this, this uh, from a computational and experimental way, I want to guide you in the naming game framework where we did both computational and empirical work. And in this view, you have two steps to, to, to study, to understand norm change. The first one is the emergence of a norm, so the problem of emergence. So you imagine a population in which there is no norm and how they set up a first one. And then the second one is how norm change can happen in critical mass. This is the framework of uh, language games more broadly, and Ludwig Wittgenstein put uh, out a thought experiment in the philosophical investigations. Imagine imagining language as a meant to serve a core communication between a builder A and an assistant B. So you have two guys that want to build a, a wall. A is building with building stones. There are blocks, pillars, slabs, and beams. B has to pass the stones in order, in the order in which A needs them. For this purpose, they use a language consisting of the words block, pillars, slab, beam. A gets them out and Brim brings the, the stone, which he has learned to bring at such a goal. So, this is a primitive language. So this is just a pair of them, but embedded in this, there is the idea of spontaneous norms, which is very similar to the idea of invisible hand, if you want. It is a way in which global consensus is the unintended consequence of individual efforts to coordinate locally with one another. That is, you have these two persons coordinating there, two there, but they also interact with one another. And even though, each one of them only care about building their own wall, they end up with a shared language. This thought experiment by Wittgenstein became a robotic experiment, thanks to the work of Luke Steele, who in the year ni um, 1990s and the year zeros, uh, ran the talking X experiments with robots. And you see, this is the pairwise interaction. You need to imagine a population from which you draw randomly these robots. They face a common scene. There is a speaker who uh, says a name. 
the hero receives the name and faces the scene and points to the object in the scenes in the scene that he thinks the name refers to. At this point, the speaker will also point. If they agree, they will reinforce their uh, association. If they don't, they will take into account different options. Now, the interesting thing here is that this showed that in small populations, because it was there were obvious limitations, there is convergence. Luke Stills then, at the beginning of my PhD, asked me the question, but what would happen in the editorial laboratory that was supervisor at the time? What would happen if uh, we had a million of them? And so we together put forth the naming, the multi-agent model, which was one of the very first model to uh, embed complex contagion. And you see, you have a, a population of agents and this is, you select two neighboring agents on the network of interactions or two random uh, agents if there is no such network. They have a series of words, each one of them, that they are invented at the beginning of the process. And you see the speaker selects randomly one name. Now there are two possibilities. In case of success means that the hearer has that name. And so both of them will delete all competitors from their own private inventory and stick to this very strong local consensus, which is mimicking the idea of the A and B of Wittgenstein. In case of failure on the other end, the hearer will just store the, the new name to take into account that in the world someone is using it. So we had a lot of fun as physicists at the beginning studying this. And you see in homogeneously mixing population, that is the fully connected uh, graph, the above figure, you have this sudden transition between a non-language and an agreement, which becomes uh, more and more sudden as the population increases. On lattice issue, you have the emergence of these different domains where different names are stable. Each color there is a different name. And on networks, you have a sort of hybrid situation. This model is relevant for critical mass thanks to a study that she and, 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 all, and collaborators put out in 2011, where they did something extremely clever. They took a majority agreeing on B, that is on one of the two names, and they put there a committed minority pushing A. So these committed minority agents would never change their mind. So the only possibility to have a consensus is that the majority agrees on it. Now, the figure shows the fact that the majority adopts the new norm if the minority is above 10%. You can study this analytically. So what is this? You have on the x-axis the density, the, the fraction of committed agents, and the consensus time. And you see that when this threshold, when the, the, the density of committed agents to A is too small, this time is actually uh, infinite, it's very, very large, okay? However, as soon as you meet a threshold that you can calculate, you can, uh, and this figure is taken by a paper we did with Dina Mistry and Nicola Perra in 2015, you have that the time suddenly drop, and which is exactly the critical mass. Now, we wanted to test this also empirically together with Damon Centola when, when it was, we started when it was based at MIT and I was in Northeastern and then we went on. And so I'll tell you the experiment we did and for the first part, emergence of conventions. So I'll tell you the user experience. You go online and you see the face of this girl, could be a guy, in this case it's a girl. You, you, you know you will play a certain number of rounds. And you have to type in the name of this person. When you are done typing, you are revealed the name that your partner in the game gave to this person. If you match, you make a little bit of money. Otherwise, you lose a little bit of money, but you never go below zero. And then you play again. Now, the question is, will they actually uh, coordinate on a single name? What they don't know, Furthermore, is that they are nodes of a social network whose topology we control. So they only interact actually with randomly selected neighbors in their social network. We had three conditions, spatial lattice, random network, and homogeneous mixing population. And we wanted to test spontaneous emergence. And we think that this is, was pretty nice because we, it satisfied a series of requirements. You have purely local coordination, you have equivalent alternatives. This we control for popular names etc. We have open-ended set of alternatives. They don't know they are in a population, even though they can infer it, but it's not obvious. 
and they don't know who they are interacting with. And this is the result. So this is the result after 24 run, runs of the experiment in a population arranged according to the network you see, where everyone has four neighbors, but they are arranged in this spatial structure. This is the histogram of the names at the end. And you see, you have clearly emerging regions where different names are popular. This is what quantitatively you have. You have the known frequency, different names at a certain time, and in the inset, you have the prediction of the naming game. Uh, from this, you see that even though certain norms reach 40%, you will never expect them to jump to global consensus because you have this regionalization of consensus. This is true also, this local coordination for a random graph, and this is what we observe there. Once again, the model good, does a good job in our observation window. Well, this is the radically different um, scenario we faced in fully connected graphs where the picture was a picture of a guy and John took actually over. And you see at the beginning you have this, the same confused uh, pattern of different dominating norms but at a certain point one takes over and breaks the symmetry. So the spatial network reminds us of the coexistence of norms on spatial networks for example the name for uh, sparkling drinks in the US while we know that in highly connected scenarios, typically one synonym dominates, like as for the word spam. And then the model would suggest that if we had time, this is also the universality class of the random graph. We replicated this also for larger population. You see after 20 rounds for 96 agents, we have a sort of intuition where things are going. And so this is a nice empirical uh, support for the case of spontaneous consensus. Let's Come to the second part, norm change, critical mass. Well, based on what I've told you about the modeling, I guess you can now imagine what, what I, I'm gonna tell you. So in the experiment, we let first the system evolve normally, as, we, as I've told you. So they agree on a certain name. Once they have agreed, we introduce few confederates who will push a different name. The nice thing of this empirical setting is that we can really work on one by one uh, increasing and tuning of the threshold. This was again done with Damon and also with Joshua Becker, who's just moved to London, and uh, David Brick Berkeley. So let me tell you, let me show you what happened. So here we have uh, we are after they have agreed as we have seen before. The light gray is the share of users using the consensus name. The black dot is the share of users using the name pushed by our committed minority. And this is what happens. Well, nothing in this case. That is, we are below the tipping point. So the, the size, the number of confederates we have put in is too small. But this is what happens above the tipping point. So, well, this animation is probably too slow, but what you see is that you have this crossing between the two curves, and actually you have that the minority has managed to impose the threshold of the majority, and the threshold being 25%. We replicated it several times, and we, have, if we confirmed that this 25% is actually the threshold for our experiment, and we can also, particularly Josh worked a lot on this, uh, do a best response naming game informed by the data which predicts the right threshold. So the take home message is that we have experimental evidence for tipping points in social convention and also for the emergence of consensus first and then tipping points. A best response naming game captures the 25% threshold but of course we don't claim that this is a universal threshold at all this is true for our model. Uh, different thresholds are expected to apply to different problems. The key point is that we confirm the critical mass can work and observe a threshold which is way below 50%. So it's definitely a minority influence on the majority. So thank you very much. This is um, the collaborators uh, for the papers I, I commented with you, Roberta Matalo and Barra, Joshua Becker, Demon Sintola, Luca Dallasta, Albert Diaz-Villera, Maddalena Felici, Lucas, 
La Casa, Vittorio Loreto, Nicola Perra, and Luke Stills. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm eager to hear your comments and questions. Thank you.